not enough to tell the teacher, oh, I really want you to be a team player. I want you to be this. Your actions and your words have to reflect that. If you want her to be a team player, then invite her to be a team player and say, how would you like to contribute to our faculty? Teachers love that. Teachers want to contribute, especially veteran teachers. Everyone wants to share their ideas. Give her the opportunity to have a voice. Hi, I'm Ron Spromberg, co-founder and CEO of Hi Mama. Welcome to our podcast about all things early childhood education. Connie, welcome to the Preschool Podcast. Great to have you back. Thank you, Ron. It's really great to be back. I'm excited to be here. So this is the first time we're having a guest return to the podcast, so that's awesome. And today we're going to talk a little bit about staff and employee engagement within early childhood education. It's such an important topic. I'm personally very passionate about this subject. So let's get into it. And the way I want to start the conversation is around difficult staff. What does that mean to you? Well, difficult staff can mean so many different things, you know, and it really depends on how the director is going to define it. Like, some directors can define difficult staff as staff that don't show up on time. Some directors can define difficult staff as staff that just have tons of opinions and are always contradicting or always have a different voice. Um, some directors think that that's amazing, you know, people that have like a voice. So mm. difficult staff is a very broad term. And um, let, maybe we could get a little bit more specific on like, like some of the difficulties of what early childhood directors would be dealing with now in the beginning of the year. Yeah, maybe we can, uh, to your point, um, which is very yeah. interesting, uh, different directors or, might view certain behaviors as either difficult or actually the opposite and very yeah. uh, uh, c- uh, contributory to the success of the program for the exact same behavior. So maybe we can yeah. go through what some what, what some of the things are that you believe are actually sure. should be viewed as sort of toxic or difficult behavior and stuff that sure. some some directors may view as difficult behavior, but actually maybe they should change their perception of that. Yeah, that's a great, great question. It's, it's um, so I'll, I'll start off with what the, um, the, the toxic behaviors that a lot of directors see and, and some directors don't view this as toxic. They view it as like, this is just the way it is. Mm. And it's actually toxic. And it's yep. important to actually recognize and define it as toxic behavior because as long as you define it as, well, this is just the way it is. And this is the system. And this is just how it's always been. You will never, ever see the change that you want. So it's really important to define that it's a toxic behavior and it could be changed if you're going to change the environment. Always remember that as a director. You do not change people. You do not change their behavior. You change the environment. You cannot change a 30-year-old, 20-year-old, 25-year-old. You don't change them. You change the environment and the circumstances that you create as the leader. So I'll go into some examples, okay? For example, this happens a lot now at the beginning of the year where you can have a mixed bag of staff. So staff that have been veteran teachers in your school for 10, 15, 20, 30 years. And then you have some newbies who've been there for two, three years. And then you have completely fresh off the bat, right out of college, first year in the classroom. Okay. And you have this mixed bag and you're doing the staff development. Okay. And so what happens a lot is, is that the new teachers are very eager. They're really listening. They want to learn because they don't know. Okay. Yeah. And they're new because they're not going to really challenge the status quo because they're very new. And so they don't know what's acceptable in this culture yet. The older veteran teachers, this is what will happen on, it just happened last week, where a director told me that at a staff meeting, one of the teachers were like, I feel like you're treating me like I'm in first grade. I know all this stuff already. Why are we going through all of this? And the director was really taken aback by the the teacher's response. And so after the, she didn't respond to her at the meeting, but afterwards she contacted me, this director. Uh, she's a private client, and she said, what should I do? How do I respond to this teacher? And I said, well, the first thing is you recognize that there's an issue with the teacher that she feels that she was being treated like a first grader. Whether or not it's true yeah. or whether or not you actually did it, that's what she feels. And that's a really important distinction to make as a leader. 
it doesn't matter if you didn't mean to hurt them or if you didn't actually hurt them. If the person felt that they were treated a certain way, their feelings are very real. It's very important to recognize that. Okay? So the man, I told her that she was like, oh, well, you know, you're probably right. Like, I might have been dumbing down the curriculum thing because I had a lot of newbie teachers there. So maybe I was doing too much scaffolding. And she probably felt like, oh, my God, why am I sitting through this? I was like, okay. That's the first thing you're going to recognize the teacher. Um, actually, like, verbally express that. You know, maybe I was scaffolding the content um, into a lot of bite-sized pieces because we did have a lot of new teachers there. And I can understand how that made you feel uncomfortable. So here's how I want to propose to go forward. And I told her to ask for these two questions. Number one, what would you like to get out of our staff meeting? And number two, how would you like to contribute to our staff meeting? As a veteran teacher, you have a lot of experience, been in our school for many years. I'd love for you to contribute to our staff meetings as well. And you don't have to answer me right now. You can let me know in a couple of days. But I'd love to know your thoughts on these two questions. And this immediately switches the mindset of the teacher where she sees that you want her to be on board. It's not enough to tell the teacher, oh, I really want you to be a team player. I want you to be this. Your actions and your words have to reflect that. If you want her to be a team player, then invite her to be a team player. And say, how would you like to contribute to our faculty? Teachers love that. Teachers want to contribute, especially veteran teachers. Everyone wants to share their ideas. Give her the opportunity to have a voice. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like um, a, a key part of what you're explaining here is that the first step is you have to recognize the problem and get yes. over this question of, you know, this is just the way it is. Well, actually, yes. no, you know, you can change that as a leader by empowering your staff. And I really like that idea of asking them, you know, how do you want to do it? What recommendations do you have for us to do something differently? Because that really does empower the staff and shows them, like you said, with actions instead of just words that you want to hear their voice and have them contribute. Yeah, because a lot of directors are all about the talk of like, oh, I want to hear your opinion. I wanted this. But then when they ask their opinion, the director already made the decision before she even asked their opinion. And teachers know that and they feel it. So if you're going to make an executive decision and then you're going to ask the staff, like, what do you guys think? Don't ever do that. Only come and ask your people for advice and input on things that you're actually going to take into consideration. Okay, so don't come to the staff and say, so when do you think we should have midwinter break? You're not asking their opinion. You're going to make that decision with or without their ideas because that's a decision that you're making on, on the school calendar. Yeah. Right? You're not asking for the teachers to so don't ask them. Yeah. Just to make them feel involved. They're not spies. They're adults. They know that you're making this decision without them, and that breaks trust. Because then they know that when you ask them for something, you're not really asking. You're just asking to make them feel good, and you're patronizing them. Don't right. do that. That erodes the culture. Yeah. And I guess, you know, maybe I, I'm asking leading questions here, but what about what what about other behavior like, you know, they're just not, you know, a staff member's not showing up on time or they're sure. saying negative things to their peers. Uh, you know, yeah. is this different? Is this a, come from a different source of a, an issue or, or what's going on with, with those situations? Sure. So there's, uh, you act like two like completely different kinds of like things like showing up on time is like one kind of problem. And then the other one, like, you know, faucet, Nike behavior, stuff like that. So the first thing is, is that, um, you know, you ever watch like a kid's puppet show, right? With like the strings of a puppet. Okay. And so when you're watching a puppet show, sometimes you could see the strings and sometimes there are certain strings that are making the puppet move that you don't see. Okay. As a director and as a school leader, there are certain strings that are consistently driving teachers' behaviors. And you don't always see all the strings. And your job as a leader is not to have all the answers, but to have great questions to figure out what are those hidden strings that are driving these teachers' behaviors, and then how can I create a better environment for these behaviors to change? Mm -hmm. So 
I just want to preface by saying that and then go into the concept of just time and teachers coming on time and not coming on time. Um, one of the things that I told, uh, that I gave the directors, I have a private circle of directors that I work with, and one of the action steps that I gave them to do was that they need to go through the teacher handbook and choose two policies that were in their handbook and change it to a standard. So by changing the word policy to standard, you all of a sudden hold teachers to a higher level, okay? Think about yourself. Everyone has personal standards and values, right? Whether you have a religious standard or just personal standards, everyone has standards of like, I, I, I would never do that. Why? Because that's not my standard or that's not what I believe in or that's not part of my value system. Okay, everyone has that. Now, in a school, you should have standards, not policies, right? So one of the directors took one of the policies in her handbook, which is about um, teachers need to come with adequate time before their, um, their shift begins, right? So just uh, let me repeat that to you. Teachers need to come with adequate time before their shift begins. And I messaged the director and I said, that is beyond vague. That doesn't tell me what the standard of the school is. That doesn't tell me what I have to do. And so we switched it and it said the school standard is teachers need to come 15 minutes before their shift begins. Do you see the difference between the two wording? Totally. So now you're holding the teacher to the standard. So if she doesn't come on time, when you bring her into the office, it's okay, Ron, or whatever it is, our school standard is to be here 15 minutes before. Today's the third day you arrived only five minutes before. So let's talk about that. Because the standard is 15 minutes. Now you can hold her accountable to a standard, not a vague description of adequate time. Well, I think 30 seconds is adequate time. Mm. So it sounds like pulling things together, a, a key part of sort of the journey here, if you're the leader managing staff in a, in a child care or early learning setting, is you need to take responsibility for your programs by setting up the right environment. And at that yeah. point, uh, then you can hold your people accountable for very specific yeah. standards that you've set. And if you've set the right environment, then you can sort of differentiate between is it, you know, is the responsibility on me for not, you know, asking the right questions and having the right environment or is uh, the challenge yeah. with actually this specific staff member? Yes. And you nailed it when you said this specific staff member, because a lot of times directors overestimate the problem. They magnify, they're like, all my teachers are coming in. I'm like, right. really? Look at your roster. You have one teacher who comes late out of 15. Right. That's not all teachers, okay? And that's how you know that's not an environment issue. That's a teacher issue. Yes. Right? Because if 14 people are coming on time, you've created the right environment. It's this person that struggles with it. So now let's work with this one person. Let's help this person rise to the occasion. Yeah. So, so the the example you brought up about creating very specific standards around, you know, what time to come in before your shift, I think, is a really good example of how you can set up a clear responsibilities for the educators on your team. What about sure. some of the let's say, less tangible things like inspiring and motivating your staff, sure. um, you know, that's hard to do with something like standards. Is there other things yes. that we can do as leaders in, in regards to that? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So this is, this is another thing when it comes to mindset shifts, okay? So as a leader, uh, this is something that Simon Sinek said when I ran the EC Leadership Conference back in February. Um, one of the things that Simon said when I interviewed him was brilliant. He said, the job of the director, the leader, is not to take care of the kids. Your job as the leader is to take care of the teachers whose responsibility it is to take care of the kids. And what happens is this director spends so much of their day worrying and being busy with the kids and the curriculum and this and that and things that are not their responsibility. Your responsibility is to take care of the teachers. When you take care of them, they will take care of the kids, the curriculum, and all the things that they need to take care of. And so 
when it comes to motivating and inspiring your staff, right? In the beginning of the year, like before the kids come in, there's a lot of this motivation and inspiration going on, right? Directors are running these staff meetings and they're bringing in professional development and they're setting up the classroom and they're doing all these game icebreakers and connecting days and they're buying lunch for the teachers every day and like all kinds of stuff like that, right? And then what happens, the first day of school comes and life throws 20 curveballs in the teacher's face. 12 kids are crying, there's three accidents, one kid threw up, this mom's yelling, and it's like chaos. And then everything that you worked on for the past two weeks, you feel like, oh my God, what did I do? Like there's mayhem here, okay? So this actually happened this year where we started um, two days before Labor Day was the first day of school, or a couple days before Labor Day was the first day of school. And she messaged me before and she's like, oh, I'm such a good staff development, I'm so excited, like, all my teachers are so, like, really collaborating together, and they were really vulnerable, and they really shared a lot of stuff. Like, I'm really excited about the year. And she messaged me, like, 48 hours later, and she's like, oh, my God, I spoke too soon. Like, <laughs> everyone was running into my office with emergencies and problems and all kinds of crazy stuff. And I was like, this is supposed to happen, right? Because that's the natural order of things, right? Like, all the kids come in, and the teachers feel all this pressure. I said, the way to bring back that feeling is to be consistently bringing that feeling into the school, right? Schools have these professional development weeks in September. Maybe they do one other day in January, and then they do reflection in June. And they expect teachers to stay motivated and inspired. Imagine if your husband bought you flowers in the beginning of the year. Six months later, he said, I love you. And six months later, he took you out for dinner and expected there to be some kind of relationship going on there. Are you kidding me? You can't do that. You can't check in three times a year and tell me that you love me. That doesn't work. So why does that work with a teacher and director relationship? Totally. You can't just check in three times a year and expect your staff to be motivated and inspired. You can't do that. So the, so what I told the director was I said um, she has 12 classes. I asked her if she was going to school that night. And she said, yeah, I'm going back to, into work. I have to do a couple of stuff. I said, great. I want you to walk into every single classroom, and I want you to write one thing that you see that is beautiful about their classroom setup and environment, and I want you to write it down. Then I want you to come home, and I want you to write an email that's sent to all the teachers that says, I just went around to all the classes, and I want to highlight to all of you the beautiful things that I noticed in each classroom. And then I want you to list, in this classroom I saw this, in this classroom I saw this, in this classroom I saw that. And then right at the bottom, I look forward to continuing to see how the classroom evolves and be part of your learning journey. Yeah. She said it makes such a shift. Like it just, it, it like twisted everyone right back to that week of inspiration that they had just a couple days earlier. And, and, and what I said, I, why? Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. What do you want to say? I, I was going to say that, you know, what, what I always find so surprising every time I hear examples like this is just actually how simple and easy uh, yeah. it is, yeah. right? It's not like it yeah. took like a week of uh, effort <laughs> no. or anything like that. It's such a small <laughs> thing, but it means so much to, so the, much. to people, right? So much to the teacher. Not, it's not earth shattering science here. It took her 20 minutes to write that email took her about 30 minutes to observe in the classes and has a massive impact yeah. on the teachers yeah. because it shows them, I'm here for you. I really notice how hard you're working. And as a director in early childhood center, you have to do that more than in corporate offices. Teachers are the most underpaid professionals. They work yeah. so hard. You've got to give this to them. Yeah, totally. They're not, they're not being recognized financially no. and monetarily so you know they need that even that extra bit they of recognition outside that yeah. yes yes totally okay so we've covered a lot of great stuff if you had to sort of summarize you know in a few sentences like what is your biggest advice to leaders out there in early childhood education that are managing staff a loaded question. Um, <laughs> I think <laughs> I think I'm going to focus on like right now in the beginning of the school year, right? We're in September, yep. um, fresh start. Um, I think the biggest focus as the leader is about building that relationship right now with your staff. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is consider this the honeymoon phase. Okay, so 
when you first get married, you're in this honeymoon phase, you're constantly thinking about what else can I do to show myself that I love them? What can I buy them? Can I write them a card? Can I put a secret chocolate in their, in their purse? Can I do this? Can I do that? Like, you're constantly thinking about these things because you're in this honeymoon phase, right? And so I think that right now in September, even though you as the leader, you're so overwhelmed with everything that's going on, and there's so much that happens in the beginning of the year, and everyone's, like, loading on you like a ton of bricks, make that time to build that relationship with the teacher. Mm. Find out what, like, just find out about her. You know, is she having a baby soon? Did someone in her family just get married? Mm. Is um, like, what's going on in her life? And ask her about it. Find out about it. Take the time to do those things. And more importantly is not just by asking, but also by genuinely showing that you really notice the effort that they're putting in. In the beginning of the year, teachers put in a ton more hours than they're paid for. A ton more hours. Okay, they're working at home. They're putting stuff in. They're staying after school. These are going to until 8, 10 o'clock at night. I remember when I was a teacher, I was thinking until 1 o'clock in the morning setting up my classroom. And you don't get paid for that, okay? And you don't care that you're getting paid for that or not. You want your classroom to be amazing, okay? Recognize that. Email the teachers personally. Those are important. It's more important to take the time to send the email, to get that teacher a coffee, to buy her a favorite chocolate. It's more important to do that than to take care of all the other things in your to-do list. That can wait. That can wait an hour or two. Your staff need this from you. It's fuel for them. Yeah, that's a good point just in terms of prioritization, right? Because there's always so many things happening, so many oh, fires to put out, so many operational yeah. challenges. Um, you always deprioritize just naturally this piece of and you know recognizing yeah. your team which actually is a top priority and should be at the top of the list but unfortunately yeah. when there's all these things that are so much more sort of in your face um you know you tend to deal with those first so that's a good point um and, and a lot of what you're saying uh is around you know just treating your team like people and um recognizing their work and putting yourself in their shoes which i think is uh, a great way to view things now i also wanted to cover the other side of things because a lot of our listeners out there are probably uh the staff members that we're talking about they're early childhood professionals that are working in sure. these environments what advice do you have to them to try and create this type of environment or maybe support their peers or their uh, directors of their programs? Yeah, so again, it, it, and I understand it's very difficult as a teacher to kind of think about other people because you're very wrapped up in your own classroom. Um, there's a lot of kids coming in, a lot of kids are crying, a lot of new parents, you have to put up a good impression. It's very difficult to think about anybody else. And, and I totally, totally get that. But even if you're just recognizing, like, the new teacher that's next door in the classroom, just walk in there, okay? She doesn't live a plane ride away. She doesn't live in China. She's right next door. It's four steps. Um, sometimes I feel like teachers feel like they each run their own, like, submarine. Like, no, you don't. Like, it's four steps. Like, see your head in and say hi. Good morning. Um, is there anything that I can get you? You know, do you need, like, help finding any of the supplies? Um, you know, did you get all the paperwork or whatever it is? Like, um, I just wanted to let you know, you usually we have like the staff barbecue. I know that the director is going to send a note about it, but it's coming up in about a couple of weeks. So, you know, just mark your calendar. Um, just let the person be in the know of what's going on. Something like that goes such a long way to creating a warmer, cozier environment for everyone because you care about me. So that's just one step. If you're the veteran. Go in there and be there for the younger teachers. Don't be cocky and be like, well, I know everything, and knowledge is power, and withhold information. Don't do that. Like, be there for the staff, okay? That's the first thing. The second thing is, is that also recognize the director is working really, really hard. And just like you like appreciation, she's a human being, and so does she. Uh, and you can send her an email and say something like, you know, I really appreciate you giving me time to do this, or thanks for buying us lunch today. It made such a big difference. Uh, you know, 
or whatever it is, or thanks for letting me come 15 minutes late today. You know, it, I had to drop off my son, and that just made a big difference that you didn't make a big deal about that. I appreciate it. Like, the director is constantly putting himself on the line for you. And a lot of times you don't even realize it. So maybe even just take this next week to try to open up your eyes to when the director is putting herself in the first line of defense and recognize her for that. Because yeah. she's human also. And it goes a long way. It sounds like one of the key takeaways for me from all of this is we all need to recognize each other more often yes. for all the amazing yes. work we're doing. Uh, like yes. we said before, you know, yeah, no, nobody's in this to, to make a ton of money. <laughs> Nobody no. No. came into early childhood education for that reason. Yeah. We came into early yeah. childhood education to help support the development of our youngest children, which we all know is super duper important and we're all working yeah. super hard. And sometimes we, we get lost in all the, the challenges and difficulties of the day to day that we forget to recognize each other for all the amazing stuff that we're doing, uh, because we're always dealing with the, the issues that are at hand. And so I think that's yeah. a, a great, great I, point. Yeah. And I also just want to add one more thing is that like a lot of directors aren't on site all the time now at the beginning of the year. Like, they're either doing, you know, uh, licensing or thing, or they're just stuck in their office a lot, um, or they can't even make it to the site. Don't feel limited by like, well, I'm not actually in the location and feel like, well, I can't, um, I don't know, tell them thank you, whatever it is. We live in a virtual world. Mm -hmm. um, we have phones, we have emails, there's Skype, there's Zoom. There's, yep. there's so many different ways to show people that you're there for them. So I'll just end up with this story that, you know, I was in California, I was doing a conference, and I was away for, it ended up being around three and a half days. My husband was home with the three kids, uh, with our three kids. And one of the days that I was in California, I called up the sushi place locally where we live in Brooklyn, and I had them deliver his favorite sushi with, with um, the can of fresh that he liked to the door. And I sent him a voice and I said, hey, I just want to let you know, really appreciate everything you've been doing with the kids, you know, holding up the cord and everything. This is a surprise coming to the door. That took me exactly 10 minutes, okay? Cost me 15 bucks. wasn't about that. It was about, I'm across the continent. I'm across America right now, and I'm thinking about you, okay? You don't have to be physically in the building to show your people that you're thinking about them and that you're caring about them. Yeah. You have to have them top of mind. That's and a good if point. you truly care about your staff, you will think of ways to show them I care about you. I believe in you. I'm here for you. I know I'm not physically in the building. I know a lot of directors have multiple sites and multiple locations, and they can't be everywhere. You don't have to be. There's so many different ways to do that. The question is, is this a priority for you? Yeah. Connie, as always, this has been a phenomenal conversation and on a super duper important topic about motivating, empowering, inspiring early childhood educators out there. If I'm listening to the podcast, I want to get in touch with you to learn more uh, or maybe I can use your help in, uh, in my own child care program. How do I get in touch with sure. you? Sure. So you can check my website, discoveryconsulting.com. But actually, one of the things that I'd love to add is that we have, I created a school culture model workbook, which actually defines all the different stages of school culture with strategies and tips of how to get your set out of toxic behavior, comfortable, all different levels in the school culture. So if you're looking to figure out how to actually create a better environment for your staff, download that workbook um, to get those strategies and tips. That sounds like an awesome resource. And I, I'm going to personally yes. say to everyone that's listening, you should definitely check that out. I'm also <laughs> very passionate about culture in early childhood education. So people check it out. Uh, get in touch with Connie if you want to learn more. And Connie, thanks again for joining us on the Preschool Podcast. Thank you for having me, Ron. It's always a pleasure. Thanks. If you enjoyed our conversation, don't forget to subscribe for more episodes and leave a review. The Preschool Podcast is brought to you by Hi Mama. If you're anything like the thousands of teachers listening to the Preschool Podcast, you know how long it takes to fill out daily sheets, child portfolios, and lesson plans. And that's where Hi Mama saves the day. With an easy-to-use interface built by teachers for teachers, Hi Mama can cut the time you spend on documentation and parent engagement in half. Create and send beautiful daily sheets, photos, videos, and messages to parents in seconds, saving you time in your busy day. Podcast listeners can get a free tour with one of our community advisors. 
Go to HiMama.com.